Excellent. And yes, we are finally live and we are very alive and we are kicking. We are ready to rock. We will dock you is the title of today's live stream. And I can proudly say that that was not my idea because it was the idea of the two fantastic guests that we have with us today. Before we get started, though, just a couple of uh, reminders, data on Kubernetes community. If you're not aware, you should be because we're putting out lots of reminders about this. We have the DOK day coming up on October 24th in Detroit. I hope that either one or both of today's speakers will kindly submit a talk for that. Each speaker can submit up to two uh, CFPs. This will be open until about the first week of September. So get those in. All right, we've already got about 30 CFPs that have come in, which is good. But we're expecting that to increase as the summer rust sort of breaks off and, and, and folks kind of get back into the swing of things. Another thing that very excited to mention is that one of today's speakers will also be in a, uh, a get together that will be happening online at the end of this month next week or no in two weeks um, on the 31st and also one of our sponsors uh, memphis.dev will be participating in that and that will be about data streaming hardcore kubernetes right the, the good titles just don't stop coming from the wonderful folks at commodore i first had the pleasure of hearing about commodore uh quite a while ago people that really understand the pain points of what it's like working with folks that are dealing with the difficulties of getting started on Kubernetes, making Kubernetes work for their organization. Here we're going to be taking it today very directly to the side of stateful workloads. But before we do that, we are joined by two seriously cool people. I don't say that in every live stream. We've done 144, and these are two seriously cool people. If you could have a license to be cool, they would definitely be well licensed. And that being said, I would like to introduce Guy and Uli from Commodore. Super stoked to have you with us today. We will dock you. I don't know who wants to go first. Uli, you do have sunglasses on, so I may have to give preference to you. This was my plan exactly. So <laughs> thank you, Bart. I'm Uli Hofesh from Commodore. I'm a dev at Commodore for the past year and a half. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Commodore is a troubleshooting platform for Kubernetes and uh, Guy and myself have met with many, many people working on Kubernetes. And we've uh, got, we got to know the pain points and the struggles of working on Kubernetes. And today we're gonna talk about how to uh, embark on your stateful journey. And Guy is the perfect person to deliver this talk. Uh, we're gonna do this together, but Guy is really the expert here. He has, uh, I don't know anyone that age that has hands-on experience working with bare metal mainframes all the way to cloud native and Kubernetes. I don't know, I don't think there's anyone under 50 who can say <laughs> he had that experience. And uh, when Guy was working with mainframes that he was actually serving in the army. I don't know if you know. So some of you are probably working for banks or cybersecurity and you think your data is really precious. Guy, my friend here was working with some very serious shit and he has done this journey himself. And today a uh, guy will take us on the same journey on a personal level for you, the beginners who want to learn. Um, um, stateful workloads and if you already know them and you are an expert yourself you also might need uh, a bit of guidance on how to train your team and how to teach them sometimes uh, knowing something doesn't mean that you know how to teach it but uh, fortunately for all of us guy knows uh, both and he is going to take us on this amazing journey so without further ado no no pressure guy no pressure <laughs> yeah. at all it's, with that, with that intro, you've got to give a lot of guidance, if I can say that. I'm sure it's not the first time you've heard that. But that being said, now that we know that Guy is also Benjamin Button and is 22 years old, going backwards in age, what else can you tell us about it yourself, Guy, that we don't know already? Yeah, so uh, I was on the mainframe side for a long time. We run databases as DB2. It was like the stateful, my first stateful application that I made, like stateful, some tapes or files on the, on those. Uh, and what is nice is that nothing changed much. Like you used to run mainframes and application and stateful. And when you're running on Kubernetes, it's exactly the same structure of application. We are going to talk about it today. And I'm grateful to have this journey and warm word uh, from Udi that um, I can see the changes. I can see the trends. And I really want to help and share the knowledge that we saw like in the last few years on other technologies 
But today with Kubernetes and the struggle to migrate uh, uh, the workloads or to create new of them um, on Kubernetes. Um, one one minor thing, guy, we're not seeing your camera. I'm not sure why that is with the sharing. I'm not sure. Mm. Um, I know what's the problem, I guess, uh, because of the, you, you don't see it at all or you see only Udi? No, 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 I see, I see your screen. Um, I just say, uh, if Udi wants to be entertaining in the background, he's more than invited to do so. Um, but just in case, that, that was the only minor thing. That's okay. Yeah. You want to sit in here, Udi? We are the same room. It's, it's, it's. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. And the thing is, Udi is keeping it super cool with those sunglasses on. I feel and my distance. I think this is all the fact that Udi's going to give us a promo code later to get those sunglasses, and if we buy them, he gets a commission. Exactly. No spoilers, but oh, sorry, sorry, I wasn't supposed to say that. Anyway, <laughs> we signed an NDA earlier. Anyway, guy, keep going. Yeah. So, what is the stake for tonight? So, we want to share. Um, we want to rock you or duck you uh, with all the things that we learned from. Uh, customers, prospect, everyone is going through the process of adopting stateful workload in Kubernetes. And we want to share uh, what is the key challenge and what are they struggling with, what they are scared of, and when, when, you, when is the good time to start? When you need to understand that it's a good time to start and you have all the things and the right motivation and how to do it. Because what we find out that we're talking with many, many customers uh, around this area that they don't know where to start. They don't know how to get the knowledge. They don't know how to build a team and definitely don't know how to migrate their own uh, application. Um, so for today, what is critical? This is the first one for today. Then what are the challenges? Uh, what are the main blocks and how to overcome it? And the full journey as we see it uh, from start to end. Um, so stay with us tonight. Um, so. We understand that stateful applications or stateful at all, and usually database and queues, and actually the heart of the application. We call it the drum and bass because there's something that sometimes in the background, they keep the rhythm of your application, they keep everything uh, on top, and you build a lot of great songs out of it, but it's kind of behind. Uh, but what it is, it's the heart. You can't go any further without it. And we see that. Any application, it can be a web UI, it can be a stream, it can be on any device that you know, uh, have this database. When you use your SaaS platform, when you use application on your mobile, even on the mobile, you got a small database spreading for each application like SQLite that helps you to an app's application to actually handle the state for workload. So, and queues an event-driven system as uh, part of our day-to-day -day life. So we understand that um, it's not only about developing the business need for your application, it's about some of the application and the stateful application, databases, queues, file stores, file manager that maybe uh, in cache, even databases that have some store, everything actually uh, been there needs to be super critical, super tight. Uh, and if it's down, it's completely uh, awful for your application. And it's not only that. So because of the article application, it can create a very serious impact, right, Eddie? Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, um, so the data is like the heart of the organization and it's the most important thing. And that's why it can have a huge impact. So messing around with data versus uh, messing around with other code is kind of like playing with scissors versus playing with fireworks or playing with a gun, God forbid. So like if you're playing with scissors, it's still very dangerous. Like you can do amazing stuff. You can do cutouts, you can do uh, crafts, but if you play with scissors, you run the risk of maybe you touch yourself. Maybe like at a very, very, very worst case, you lose a finger. Um, but that, that, that's scissors. When we're talking about uh, fireworks, you can actually die. You can lo uh, lose your life. So uh, data is kind of like that. Stateful is very impactful. So when something happens, it has a major uh, effect because uh, depending on the organization, losing data is a big no-no. 
Um, and depending on the organization, it can be like a half a minute, 10 seconds of, uh, of downtime. It can be very critical. So what we've seen from uh, our experience, uh, uh, me and Guy talking to uh, customers and uh, people using Kubernetes, we know that uh, incidents are inevitable. They're going to happen no matter what. And same goes for stateful workloads. And um, we know that for minor errors, there's a very high possibility they happen all the time, but they have a low impact. So um, when they do happen, it's fairly easy to fix. It's uh, fairly uh, not too uh, hurtful for the for the system of the organization. But as you go down, uh, you see more and more severe incidents like uh, unavailability or uh, further down the funnel of doom. Uh, you have the, a severe downtime. And at the very bottom, just before you plunge into this dumpster fire, you have data loss, which is uh, if we have, if we could cue like a dramatic effect here, then this would be the dun dun dun. So data loss is the scariest thing that can happen to an organization. And it's low possibility, it doesn't happen often, it doesn't happen every day. But if and when it happens, it has an extreme impact and it can really hurt the organization big time. Uh, it's not just uh, like a six hour downtime like uh, Facebook experienced uh, last year. We're talking about uh, losing money, losing customers, facing legal action, or maybe, um, you know, just losing the whole operation. Am I being too hy hy hyperbolic here, guy? I think. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's okay. It's as it's. You know, when there is a low possibility, and we know that always when the database is down and you try to restore something, you ask yourself, did they lose data or not? And you understand that if something happens to your data, it's a business impact. 1% that you got a business impact out of it. You can avoid it, really. Yeah. And uh, depending on your business, it can be life or death. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being too dramatic today. Um. So now that we know, we have established that this is very impactful, very important, very critical. So what other, what other challenges, Guy, do you know? Uh, can you name a few from our experience? Yeah, so the, the challenges are pretty, they are there. Like we understand that there is some impact, there is a possibility that something going to happen, um, but still people want to, adopt stateful workload in Kubernetes. And we are going to explain why later. But what are the key challenges? Like Doc did a survey on that. And we talked with many customers on, on that specific issues because those are the challenges. And we understand like that lack of knowledge and expertise, it can be a real challenge for managers to take a decision to start with their workloads. Why is that? It's like that you have a, a band member that don't know how to read notes. Uh, it's really bad to start that way because then you need to understand each note, how to take it, how they can be in symphony and octave. Uh, and all of this can be very crucial. And you need to, to trust the people. And if you don't trust them to have the right knowledge. It's like, it's like a band member who can't read notes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if the main member cannot read notes, it's a real problem in <laughs> the Kubernetes era. And, and like Jimmy Hendrix, if you, if you don't know, uh, couldn't read notes. And, you know, Jimmy Hendrix is one of the greatest, uh, if not the greatest guitarist uh, ever made. But we are not the Jimmy Hendrix of Kubernetes. So we definitely need to understand how we can overcome this gap and how we get the right knowledge. The next thing is about having a good team. Like you're going to, to put things on the cloud. You need to make sure that you got the right team. It's not the knowledge of one or two people on the team because you need all of them to have a good knowledge. And it's like the Beatles. It's not like only one do one thing. You need each one of them to be an expert in what it does. And when you combine them together, you have the great team to do that. And there are no many a, a good bands member. And it's really a struggle for some companies to find the talent and the knowledge of people. And if they don't know how to uh, gain this knowledge and build their team right, 
uh, is a challenge that will not let them overcome the way to production. So you definitely need to understand that you have uh, the right uh, band members in your team uh, that will be able to take you uh, to the stateful era. Uh, the next thing is about lack of instruments and tools. We know that uh, in these days, um, sometimes um, the tools are not exact as it used to be on the VM or the instances era. We know there are some gaps. We know, for example, that in the storage era, there are some companies doing like great work, but some uh, companies are afraid to go in that area. And even on the cluster, on the database, on the third party, because usually you use some database that you buy or use an open source, you're not going to develop a database for your own. And sometimes there is a lack of tooling, there is a lack of integration today, uh, which I think uh, it's going to be uh, uh, something that's going to be uh, overcome in the next few years. And if you know that, and we're going to talk about it in the next slide, but if you're going to talk about um, what are the instruments that you need, what are the challenges that you have in the technical space, I think that all of them are going to be uh, solved in the next few years. I also want to mention that some of the tools that do exist are super complicated and hard to implement and very, very not dev friendly. Uh, and shout out again to our friends from memphis.dev. Um, they're making a, they're building a message broker that's uh, supposed to be like a lighter and more efficient and convenient uh, form of Kafka. So shout out to them. And I think uh, a lot of companies are going in that direction, like taking the big old enterprise tools and making them more uh, streamlined and more dev friendly. Same thing uh, like we do at Quando with troubleshooting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like we see a lot of startups, a lot of young companies trying to, to tackle exactly those challenges. And, and, and I believe that companies as Memphis on that, a lot of, of people that uh, supporting this community. Uh, they're, they're really good uh, uh, places to find a fit and overcome those challenges and the gaps in the technology. Because we know that Kubernetes built on for stateless. This is what it meant to be on the first place. And we want to run stateful workload because we understand that Kubernetes got the benefits uh, that can help you like to, to, to overcome orchestration challenges, uh, utilization challenges, and networking, load balancing, all of that is, is something that can be solved using Kubernetes. And I think this gap is going to be definitely solved. And the last thing is about fear and confidence. And everything we talked about previously is actually build the confidence for you, for the team, for the organization to adopt the stateful workloads. And, and we believe that, let's say you are a performer, let's say, you, you, you need to go on stage, you need to perform the song uh, that you wrote, work, instrument, mix, and now you need to perform on live. You need to have the confidence to go on stage and perform it on production in front of audience. And if you're successful, it can be a full stadium. Um, but you need this confidence. I think like in personally that when you try new technology and you need to put it into the edge, you need to have this confidence. And you need to have the people around you to give you confidence to do those kind of things. You, you give me confidence, guy. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I you hope give, it, you give me confidence to do this talk. In the next, in the next uh, show, the rock show that we do. Uh, yeah, this is. Um, I don't know if you if you know this, but this is like the school of rock. And the guy is like Jack Black, only, <laughs> only more handsome. So th this is the school of doc. Um yeah, so guy, this sounds super annoying. Why even bother with stateful? Why 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 do I need this? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like I can do without all the stress and fear. Yeah, so definitely there are amazing reasons to do that. Uh, it's not like a, a five uh, 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 guitar is like six or seven. A, a string panel that you need to instrument. But there are like real things that can push you into do that. Uh, and, and, and those are good reasons. So let's explain for each one of them what this means. First of all, cost. Like when you go with managed service 
or unmanaged service, you need to pay a lot of money. Uh, you need to pay for the cloud provider to maybe uh, manage on-prem solution, but you need to pay a lot of money. Usually when you want to save money and when you have the right technology in front of you or beside you, you can decide to go with unmanaged. We know companies that their strategy is not by any tool, uh, going full open source, going full unmanaged. Even if they're using cloud provider, they run their own managed services on top of those. And definitely if you want to run a manage or unmanaged, Kubernetes can be a good solution for that uh, because you want to enjoy the benefits of, for example, a Kubernetes cluster, but within this time. Uh, the second thing is resources footprint that we know that containers have this ability to integrate uh, and save some of the footprint with the current shared kernels, shared packages, shared layer, layers. And when we see that, when we have a full development, full QA environment going into the same cluster, when there is a remote development only, or when there is a full pipeline that blow up a full cluster with anything in it, or a V cluster, for example, we understand that the footprint has a huge impact on the cost at the end of the road because it's one database or one instance, double it with uh, one, hundreds a day, double it with months, weeks, uh, years, and then running it on VMs and like managing and operating the bootstrap process. Or sometimes you don't even do that because you don't want to bother. So you reduce. Uh, your capabilities around CI CD pipelines or CR or around uh, um, remote development stations because you don't want to invest on those. And obviously, there is the license. Licenses are uh, the software bill that we pay, uh, and we can reduce some costs in there. So, cost is a big thing, but it's not only about costs. Everything accumulates to cost, but some parts are around it. Let's say multi cloud. You want to run on a multi cloud deployment. So you want to have some standardization of, I don't want to use specific services like RDS uh, from Amazon or some of the databases of or Google or Azure or any other good cloud providers out there. Uh, you want to be agnostic to the cloud provider to move around areas, to be able to manage yourself and be self-sustained. Uh, so if one day the cloud provider will uh, uh, increase the bill that you pay for them, you will have the ability to move very fast to the other. Uh, and we see a lot of uh, organizations taking this decision to not rely on any advanced cloud provider. And when you do that, you need to be very advanced with your stateful workloads, because first of all, you manage it by yourself. Second of all, you need to have all the benefits of Kubernetes sometimes for it. So you want to make sure that you have the capabilities of Kubernetes, you keep managing by your own, and you will be able to migrate to any cloud provider or on-prem uh, when there is a decision. The third point is about Kubernetes standardization. Like today we see a lot, usually the big organization migrating from VMs to Kubernetes. But we understand that when they run their own databases and queues in, in VMs, it will be a leftovers at the end of the migration. It means that the organization will have to manage a VM infrastructure and beside it, some um, Kubernetes infrastructure. So some organizations have this goal, like by the end of 2025, 2027, I don't want to run any VMs or only VMs on Kubernetes. I want to manage only one infrastructure. It will be Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we will run everything on top of it. And then Kubernetes will be the standard in the organization. And if you want to move like your last production cluster, uh, database cluster to Kubernetes by the end of 2027, uh, 27, you may need to plan it now. Um, the other thing is about third party modernization. We understand that the tools we are using um, have some new capabilities. Like we know that there are not legacy, but more old fashioned databases, old fashioned queues. And there is a new technology uh, emerge, for example, CockroachDB, um, which is a new database. It gives a new uh, point of view on how stateful should look. 
the concurrency of things, the atomicity of transaction in this database. There are a lot of new ideas there. And you want maybe to benefit those. You want to move into Kubernetes to get a cloud native database because you want to be fully cloud native and exploit all these capabilities. The next thing is about third body modernization is automated operation. And today in Kubernetes, we have operators which usually maintained by vendors and vendors want to remove the toll from your teams to actually reduce the operation cost. And how do you do that? They use an operator or some kind of managed operator outside. And we see that sometimes the operator within the Kubernetes cluster have more capabilities and reduce the toll from uh, those teams, which is great. And you want to enjoy these features because you don't want to do the operations because your vendors know how to do that well. And we got the self-hosted and on-prem, which is usually a big question. If you self-hosted or you got everything on-prem, you need to consider move your things into Kubernetes cluster and get the benefits of Kubernetes cluster start of it. And the last point is about your product being deployed on hosted cluster. Sometimes your product is a product that someone going to deploy in his own infrastructure. And his own infrastructure, you want to package it well, you want to ship it directly, like very fast, like a CD. And you want to make sure that it's going to be sound or operate the same way that you tested it on the lab, but on their own player, uh, their Kubernetes player. Um, and what you do is actually find yourself using database that you are going to provide, manage, and deploy on your own customers' clusters. Uh, and we see a lot of on-prem products which are focused on that, uh, uh, doing that thing. Um, and, and, and we see that when you need to build a product that it's going to run on Kubernetes, you don't want to rely on your customer's infrastructure to run a, a, a few of your workloads. So uh, installation process used to be, give me a Postgres database, run my VM, and connect those. Today we see people, this is the Helm chart with all the images packed, just deploy it on your own cluster, um, which is great. Um, and now like, I want to ask for a question. If someone has any question um, about everything we talked about, the challenges, uh, why do it anyway, and everything. What is stateful? No, but yeah. there are no bad questions here. I think, you know, that's <clears throat> one of the things that, that's come up, you know, we're in live stream with number 144, is that a while back, someone even said, there's no such thing as stateless, that everything has some kind of state, no matter what. Do you agree with that? Or do you just feel like it's a, how is it, is it a point that helps drive the conversation? Does it make it easier for end users to understand? What do you think about that? Yeah, like I think that, Sometimes it is not the fault of the user. Let's say, for example, front-end uh, applications, they just serve the front-end. But at the end, when the front-end is going to be deployed to the users, it needs to get some information from a stateful workload. And it needs to maintain state. And we see that even with, with, with any application, or, or I would say 90, above 95 and above 99%, but I don't add the research on it. But I truly believe that everything comes down to, to stateful ideas. Just say it. Just say a number. I know. I think that more than 99% of the, of the application eventually will rely on something that is stateful. I think the official statistic is 97.4% of applications inevitably run on stateful. That's fair. I just, I just made that up, but it's... But it sounds good. It's a nice number. Sounds good, yeah. It's, a good, it's a good number. I how to lie uh, about statistics. <laughs> no, but I think another thing with that too is this presentation has been far, far and away one of the best, if not the best that we've seen in terms of metaphors, comedy, et cetera. And that's a really important point, you know, when talking about things that can seem so abstract, what are metaphors that you will commonly use? I mean, do you use the Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles one when you're approaching a customer or there are things that you often use to try to, you know, bring things, bring things down to earth, make it a little bit more accessible and tangible for folks. How do you approach that? 
when talking about these things of stay for workloads, for example? You always need to rely on, I believe that when you need to catch an idea in someone's head, you like need to have this kind of an analogy that will be closer to his work. Um, because because it, it's like educating. It's very good with the day-to-day -day life examples. And it's always that uh, examples that we use to, okay, what is the art of the application? Eventually where your data is. And some people get it, some people not. And then we will go to a metaphor from a, a from the day-to-day -day work, like you need to save your note somewhere and you need to, each time you go to a meeting, you need to remember it. And then the people actually try to see that in order to operate, they need some context, they need some mailing, they need some documents. And eventually when it comes to example, everything will become easier. And we pick the rock theme. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how, we just made it up. It's, uh, it just so rhymes with doc. I love it. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that that I think it's important to be able to abstract like big complex ideas, even for yourself, just um, just to understand it better. If you can, uh, I don't know who said it, but if you can't explain it to a seven year old, you don't really understand the, the subject. Agreed. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think breaking it down uh, is also useful to your to yourself. Um, my favorite metaphor, um, we don't usually go for the rock and roll theme, but when I have to uh, explain things uh, in Kubernetes, I take the car metaphor. I think it's very, very useful. Um, like, uh, for example, um, driving a car is similar to Kubernetes. Running it is simple. You have your image, you have your YAML files, you deploy, it's, it's, it's super easy. It's, it's just like driving a car. You have the, uh, the steering wheel, you move it right, the car goes right, you move it left, the car goes left. You, have it, you even have a dashboard uh, in your car. Uh, so everything is super easy and intuitive when it's uh, functioning. When your car breaks down, your engine starts smoking, then you need to pop up the hood and look underneath. And this is when you come to like same way with Kubernetes, when you need to troubleshoot Kubernetes, you uh, finally realize the entire complexity under the hood. And like with uh, most drivers, we don't know how to do a lot. We know how to do a few actions. We can change the tire. We can, uh, I don't know, maybe add cooling. Uh, water to the to the engine, but uh, we, we can only perform a few tasks like most developers on Kubernetes. And uh, when you do need to fix it, you will probably uh, tow away your car to a mechanic. But with Kubernetes, usually you are both the driver and the mechanic, uh, or at least you're expected to be one. Um, otherwise, you're just crying to your DevOps uh, mechanic that your car broke down. But anyways, uh, so this is like one of my go-to metaphors when I need to break down Kubernetes to simpler terms. No, that's a very, very good point. And once again, that's the thing is inviting people to be to be creative when they approach these things so that, so that it makes it easier. Oh, Guy, you have a Nirvana shirt on. Oh, man. Yeah, I got Nirvana and Udi's got Kiss one. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid is one of my favorite acronyms. Um, no, that's good. And, and Guy, you have us all in, in data on Kubernetes Nirvana with your, with your explanation. So anyway, this is good. What else? I mean, when we talk historically speaking, you know, people look at different dates, you know, the arrival of stateful sets and, and different things along those lines. Is this something that you've noticed in terms of your customers, you know, building up with more regular frequency in the last, how, how long would you say it's been since, you know, when you first started to come in contact with this, when you, when, you, when it first came out? Just really quickly. Mm, I'm not sure. Like it's it's a transition in some ways, and we believe that, um, and we believe that in in most of the cases we we find out some journey that the, the prospect customer has, and we want to to be his guidance. It's not always the product. We want to help people to adopt. We want to help people to be there and actually get uh, their um, benefits and knowledge in Kubernetes. 
and and it, it's in Kubernetes in general, but also with Stateful. We want to make sure that people got the right knowledge, got the right confidence, um, and we want to really share with you uh, how do we do that uh, because the journey is not is not simple at all. Um, so we'll move to the how. Uh, we talked about why, we talked about the challenges, uh, but what we don't want to do is actually uh, living on a prayer. Yeah, we should plan ahead for something like this. So how, Guy, how can we? <laughs> uh, so there are like future steps that you need to take. We build it from the organizational learning path, and then we are going to talk about what is your specific learning path. So first of all, there is the Kubernetes foundation where you need to understand the basic of Kubernetes. You need to understand the networking, the storage, uh, the operators, the pods, everything related to the fundamentals uh, or the foundations of that. Uh, before learning that, uh, it will be a big step for you because you can do, you can just run a product or run your stateful workload in production, but when you don't know the basic, it will, it will kill you at the end. And we believe there is a long process and you need to be safe because we talked about the challenges and we talked why you need to do it. And, and we want to make sure that which each steps we do, we have the right confidence, we have the right uh, team members, we got the right knowledge to move to the next steps. And if you don't build it, on the good way, you're going to find yourself like struggling and hesitating and not sure that this is exactly what you need to do. And we see companies like Zalando and, and others speaking on these doc talks and sharing their knowledge, sharing what uh, they experience and why they decided and how. And, and we believe that in order to be that advanced, you need to start for something. So build good, build the good foundations. Uh, and then you need to, to test something. Like you need to move your maybe dev environment, sandbox environment, CI environment, test environment, all of these, those are usually not a mission critical workload uh, to the company. So you want to gain confidence. You want to gain confidence within, let's say you are DevOps, you want to gain confidence within your de developers, uh, your SRE team. Maybe you are a developer who wants to run a faster CI, want to make sure that you got all the tests in place. You need to build confidence around this area and those are the best place to take. Uh, usually what I do not recommend is to do sandbox and test only because we want to make sure that we have users because troubles are going to arise. Um, problems are going to be, but you must have and should know that you have some real workload. It doesn't have to be production. But then you have your test workloads running, but it's not, it's not enough. You need to move to the next steps, which is get ready for users, real users. And to being re get ready for users, you need to build some of the more advanced operations of stateful workloads. You need to make sure that you have the backup uh, you have some way to restore the backup because we heard about companies that have backup but don't know how to restore the backup, uh, which is funny, but it, it happens from time to time. Um, how to do an upgrade? Like sometimes it's a simple task, but sometimes it's not. You need to migrate. Maybe database needs to do some, or queues needs to do some work in order to upgrade. Maybe it's a minor and major, it's a different upgrade. You need to understand how it's going to happen. You need to understand what are the performance, sizing, uh, what are the monitoring and alerting tool that you are going to use. And obviously what we want to understand and what is the availability operations and recovery drills that we want to do and want to understand. Like I'm a member, I was responsible uh, of a console like ASHICorp console, uh, which is a key value database. It's got its own uh, store. This is why it's something that I was responsible within my team. And I remember that the first thing or the second thing I did was to take it to a test, take it to a ride, kill one node out of the cluster, uh, make a leader election fail for a long time. And in order for me to be effective and make sure I know what to do when something goes wrong, 
um, I need the confidence for myself in order to reflect it to the other team members and users. So when you have this confidence to do the day two operations, you can move to the next level. And this is, I think, a good place uh, in the journey to stop and kind of solidify the knowledge that you have, right? And before moving to the next stage, this is like probably a good place to stop, maybe run some drills, some chaos engineering. Yeah. Uh, um, stress testing your... Uh, Definitely. Push the system to the limits. I think this is the best. Try to, to, to do whatever you can in order to get confidence. Because in the next steps, you're going to have some real users. Spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be scary of them. It's um, not, if it's scary, we need confidence. Exactly. Yeah. I think this is where we started at. That it's the like with that funnel of doom that ends with data loss. It's super scary, super uh, frightening. So uh, if you can overcome that challenge and you have the confidence to move and try and test, this is uh, the way to go. Exactly. And the next step is to migrate non-critical application, but it will be um, it will be like the dev, the staging, the real ones. Uh, and the non-critical workloads, we got some applications that are not in the critical path. Uh, we got application that um, only starting and you want to make sure that you, you're going to be battle tested. And this is the, the time when you uh, going to meet real users. You're going to meet some production, uh, but non-critical. We want to get it step by step, slow, understand that we know what to do, gain confidence within yourself, within the team. And then you move to the next steps. You need to get ready for production. It's not a game anymore. Uh, we are going to, everyone is going to say, okay, we understand the benefit. We put everything we need to you and you need to provide. And it's not about the data operations that we did. Usually they are more small and relative. Now you are going to push the system to each limit that you want to achieve at this moment. Um, production drills, the heavy ones, uh, participate in all, like make sure that you run and drill all your playbooks, uh, monitoring, all the dashboards are in place. You did load testing. And here it's like, the last time when you're going to um, have this safe time when there is no rush to actually try, test, and get the results that you want to get. What's next, guy? What's, What's next? So What's the next step next? I guess that everyone guessed what is the next step. And the next step is add them mission critical apps. Uh, and we know that mission critical apps are the scariest, but if you have the target, if you have the goal, if you know the challenges, this is the next step for you. And what is what is good to understand, it's, it's a process. Going from stage at the bottom of the pyramid to the top, it's not a six months process. Maybe in a small organization, uh, it's a small process, but we understand that this process can take from month to years and it's okay. It's really okay. You have a lot of work. You you don't all you don't always know what is critical and what is not. And um, you need to make sure that eventually you're going to be there. And as we said earlier, today there are some gaps. You need to know the gaps. You need to understand what is your process for you, and then um, you will get to the top. And it's not. And what, and what happens when you get to the top? And then you are going to be the king oh, of stateful workloads. Or the queen. Or the queen. You can be both of them. <laughs> the non-binary monarch of yeah. stateful set. Yeah, you reach to the top. You're like the Freddie Mercury of stateful workload. And, and we think that when you will be at the top, when you will have all your uh, mission, mission critical apps in production, when you reach all the business goals, that we talked about reducing the cost, having Kubernetes as uh, um, like the standard infrastructure uh, in the organization, everything uh, um, will fit in and you will get to your own goals. Um, but it's not like the only how. Um, then what, what, 
this is like for the learning path for the organization, but if I want to become <laughs> proficient in stateful sets, if I want to be an expert, well, how, where, where, how do I start? So yeah. What's the journey for so me? So we have not only the journey for the organization, we also have like the journey for yourself, like what you should do. And it's a long journey. It's going to be side by side within the organization, uh, but you will get there. And so we start from the basics, as we said previously, and the pod, the replica set, the deployment, the fundamentals of networking, APs, storage, everything comes to it. We understand that there is, if you are new to stateful workloads at all, like you're not running on any kind of infrastructure, you need to learn it from the basic and it takes time. On the other side, if you are migrating your knowledge, let's say from other uh, technology, it will be easier for you. But you need to understand those uh, because let's say you want, like in a few years, you, you want it to be a DBA. It's a, it's a year's process. Um, and like the next thing is about um, be, join a community. Uh, we believe that part of being there is, uh, um, is like, how you want to success. And I remember, Udi, do you remember the first time that you uh, showed me Doc as a community to join? Yeah, I think it was uh, when I uh, bought the, the uh, rap on, about uh, Nick from on that. It was it on that at the time? But yeah, it was. It yeah, was yeah. Yes, yeah. Thank you for sharing that on Twitter. So I was like, oh, wow, that was, that was, that was a while ago, but uh, that was a lot of fun. We still remember. That's how we started with Doc, I think. Or it, at least that's how I introduced the guy to Doc. But it, it was cool. Like uh, I remember that. Like when we we saw the video, I I got remembering that, and I searched in a YouTube just in general, uh, Doc Talks, and I got this video <laughs> of you rapping on me. It was amazing. Um, um, we, we do have a question here. Maybe we wanna yeah stop. So uh, we stop that where well, join a community. Yeah. Know. So yeah, join a community. If you are here, you're probably already one, uh, already part of one, and there are many other great communities, including uh, our own at Commodore. We have a uh, Slack community and uh, on other platforms. So feel free to join us. And the question is uh, regarding stakeholders. Monitoring tools need to provide an integrated developer view of DBs and the DBA view of DBs. Uh, most SREs are doubling up as DBA and an integrated view is very important. What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I don't know if you've been in this process, but DBAs used to be separated to more infrastructure DBAs and applicative uh, DBAs, and it all comes down to SREs and DevOps these days. And I believe there is things that are pretty shared between those, uh, like, Developers view may have more performance issues, uh, may have um, what indexes are more utilized, which thing, queries are not uh, efficient enough, uh, and where do you spend time? While SREs usually um, have some other views uh, that are more infrastructure related, maybe cache hitting, uh, maybe a utilization of the disks, uh, CPUs, a lot of the infrastructure thing. It depends on the role on the companies, but I really agree that DB is, is not a simple thing and you need to make sure that you have uh, the right dashboards because we understand like we, we in Commodore, we, we meet a lot of customers and what dashboard do they have today? Uh, and we believe that having the right dashboard on the right time can really save you time during an incident. And and this is the same in here. You want to have this integrated view, maybe for one, maybe for both, depends on the case, and to make sure that you have everything for the right person in the right dashboard. Yeah, this is definitely something that's uh, apparent. Uh, over, over time, I spoke with so many SREs, and it's always the case. They always need a dashboard to know exactly what's going on, and they need a tool for the developers so they can offload work from themselves so they don't have to deal with incident response, DBA, uh, cost optimization, whatever. All of those things uh, should be shifted left to, to the developers. Um, 
So yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. yeah. Um, I really agree with that. And the next thing is about adopt a tool. Uh, you join a community, you understand where to share knowledge, where to get knowledge, where to uh, uh, ask questions, which I think is the most amazing way to share and get knowledge. Because usually, if you ask questions, so many people asked it before. Uh, it's it, this. This is how Stack Overflow works. Uh, you have a question. You ask Google. Usually, you go to Stack Overflow and find out that someone asked the question and answer it. And with Kubernetes knowledge, it's different. And joining a community and posting the right question to the right people. And I know that many uh, experts are in those communities. And when I have a question, I always know that I can go to the right place and and meet with the right people and make sure that they help me. And the next thing is about adopt a tool. You need to take a tool and actually knows knows it well. Um, it can be database, it can be queue, it can be any file store, storage, type full application that you have. It's maybe your own application, which is a legacy one and you want to migrate it to Kubernetes, uh, but you need a tool. And then you go into the low environment. This is the milestone when you need to go to the low environment, you need a tool, you understand the tool, you understand its operators, and now you go with the first step on the pyramid. The next step is about day two operation, as we said, we need to, you'll need to learn those. Don't trust other people, try it on your own. Uh, if there are some basic operations, availability drills, chaos engineering that you want to put in uh, on your own, manual or automatically, depends on what you want, do that. Don't trust any other people that it works. Learn it by yourself, learn what should be on the logs, learn how your application should behave. This will make you an uh, uh, expert matter within the tool that you adopted. And then you need to uh, add the tools. And the comment that mentioned about having the right met metrics, law, observability, and dashboards is right. Because each th there are many people that involve in here. You may be responsible for the tool, but you need to understand that you got the right dashboard to go for. And then is the test on performance. And we believe that this is the second milestone. When um, we understand that which one is best for you and how you are going to integrate it within your system. Usually we find out that most of the people, uh, when they need to integrate uh, the first real environment, this is where it shines, the GitOps, the CI CD, the infrastructure is called, all the other advanced methods uh, going in place. Maybe even automatic actions, depend on what tool you're using. We have uh, no customers that are using um, their own operators. They just developed an uh, operator or something that will act to some of the tool changes, which is awesome. Um, and then you need to do the production support and make sure you know how to support the system. This is when you need to learn the most for the experts. They are the events one. They know, they battle tested. This is where I think um, you need to ask more and learn from the best. And I think DocTox is amazing uh, because Sometimes it's us sharing about uh, the learning path, using some examples, but sometimes it's other people that migrated all their uh, workloads to Kubernetes, uh, which is great. And here is the last step, like the last step of the journey. Um, and it's about sharing your knowledge. Now you're an expert. Now you know, you battle tested, you are moving to production, and here you need to share your knowledge. And also keep learning, because oh. the journey never really ends and then repeat. And uh, so I'm assuming you're at the end because you uh, you have just now <laughs> shared your knowledge with everyone on the They Don't Kubernetes community. So uh, you've done the work, you've done the path. And I also know that you keep learning and you keep uh, sharing that knowledge. Uh, you want to say a couple of words about, I, I just noticed that you were researching uh, Loft and uh, we do love Loft. And so you, you, want, you want to give it like as an example for a good community or a good- uh, Yeah, yeah. Community? Like a few weeks ago, I shared it on Twitter. Like I tried uh, Loft to see which use cases we can uh, combine together within our product, within Loft. We know that people want to have this uh, uh, dynamic environment. And I had a question, how to integrate our agent to be able that anytime you bootstrap a V cluster, um into using loft you will be able to install commodore within it it's like a simple use case that we want to make sure we can provide and 
I, I didn't try like to uh, fetch the cluster name. I have some technical issue there that I couldn't find out to do. So I posted on Loft community. I got like an answer from one of the people from Loft in like 30 minutes saying exactly what I needed. This in the product, this is beta. You can test it within this version. This is where you need to use it. And this is how to use uh, it, even if it's not in the documentation already. And it was amazing. Like I had a question, someone with the right knowledge just helped me to find out. And now I can test it and understand. And this is the power of community sharing the knowledge some people have more and sometimes you have more and you need to share cool and i also see how this kind of mirrors the organizational path as well and you and in the same way like you need to reach a certain milestone and then solidify the knowledge and then on that build more knowledge on that with confidence and so now that i know how to learn, where do I start? Where, where, where is the first step? Where is the first place I go to to learn more about Kubernetes or data on Kubernetes? Or yeah, so there are a great uh, places to learn. Um, and we shared some of the people that we believe create a good content around this. So first of all, you got the documentation and you got a lot of uh, places where you can read docs about it, read some path that somebody already built a journey for you, like 100 days of Kubernetes, the Civil Academy, there are lots of good content out there. And there are some knowledge center or learning center created by vendors. They want you to learn, they want you to be the expert, they want to make sure that you don't read a, a lot of documentation and they invest a lot of their time out of it. And also personal people on national medium, whatever we got youtube which i personally like and i think there are great people out there kunal sayan nana uh, victor anais alex like john everyone is great i really like and i really encourage you to go to the videos learn about your basics and then you can move to the advanced parts uh, all of them got both sides of the videos like they can take you from none to be an expert and there is the kubernetes journey repo uh, which is an open source repo we created to help you uh, um, understand and make sure that you know um, what is the journey for you. And it's open source because we want the community to actually build its learning path. We want you to be, uh, to add um, what is good for you, what you find useful, what you did that was a success path for you and also share it with others. So we will share the link uh, into this GitHub repo. You will see a handful of um, links in there and paths, and it's like a workflow diagram and how to be an expert. So we will share the link on the chat and later. Uh, and I hope you will go into that journey because I believe it's a good journey for you and it will gain you confidence and it will take you to the next steps of how to be an expert in stateful workloads. Uh, do 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 we have any questions? Um, just getting some great feedback in in the YouTube in the YouTube chat. I will drop this link as well to the. So if you want to take a look at the guidance that we've been receiving, um, you have the the Kubernetes journey right there. That's the thing for for a lot of people out there. It is overwhelming. Where do I start? What's the best resource? I think you know. Don't panic at the disco. Um, keep calm. Looking at you know how you explain this so well, both at a personal as well as an organizational level, because everybody knows that they want to be on Kubernetes. They want to have as much as their um, as much as they can. That's one of the other things that we've seen, and that you mentioned previously is how can we get everything all under the same umbrella, the same roof. And, and so, yeah, so these are things that, you know, people know they want to be doing, but, you know, where do I start? How can I make that happen? I guess, you know, from a technical standpoint, you, you covered some different areas here, but one of the things that comes up a lot in our community is the topic of operators. And you mentioned that some organizations will make their own. Some organizations then also run into the previous issues you mentioned. Do I have a team that's talented enough to be able to build an operator? Will my customers consider this operator to be reliable enough? What's your what's your experience been like when working with customers and when the operator, you know, because it seems like one of the 
strongest ways or patterns that we have right now for folks to be using data on Kubernetes. When those questions start to come up, what are some of the, the things that you recommend in terms of figuring out what's best for them? If it's something they should do internally or be looking externally, anything you could uh, share in regards to that? Yeah, sure, sure. I believe operators is a great tool. Uh, it can help you. It, it, really save your, it really save you in some of the cases. The, the downsides of operators that when you write your own, things become complex. Uh, why? Because uh, you miss some points, you may don't, you think you know the technology pretty well, but at the end you find out uh, something already take care of that. And it can be used for your tools or to, to like uh, populate uh, your own CRDs and use it as tools. So what I suggest is if you can, do not build. Make sure that you use uh, uh, the community ones or the vendors ones. Make sure that you keep it as simple as you can, uh, as Udi's shirt. Uh, we want to make sure that it's simple. Uh, but on the other side, if there is no solution, uh, maybe you need to develop your own or add your own or to do something on your own. But in general, uh, and if you keep it on your own, you need to maintain it. It's, it will be maintainable for a long time. So you need to take into consideration that, first of all, you may have a solution somewhere. Second of all, you may don't know uh, how it's going to act. You need to maintain for a long time. But if you did all of that uh, and you still have a problem, develop your own and make sure it's as simple as you can. Very, very good. Yeah, like you said, Udi's, Udi's shirt, what in doubt? Keep it simple, stupid, right? This is, mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds, it seems silly, but you know, really it's, it's a good thing to be constantly applying to avoid any unnecessarily, you know, difficulties or headaches. Um, that being said, we are, you know, we are getting towards, we're, we're at the top of the hour already. So if I could get you guys to stop sharing your screen so that I can share mine. Sure. You know, this was really fantastic. And I have to ask, who is the amazing graphic designer who creates these slides? There's no graphic designer, it's all us. <laughs> It's incredible. It's Serious. The guy and the guy. The guy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the good guy and the other guy. Let's go. <laughs> Seriously, like, well, like I said, we've done, you know, about 150 live streams, tons of things in, you know, in, in co-located events and KubeCons. I've never seen anything like this. And I really appreciate it because it's obviously not a presentation that's just been recycled. I don't think you've gone out and done the Jimi Hendrix and keyboard example. <laughs> and the guy with the guitar with seven necks and the reference is the school of rock. Like these things are priceless. And I think, and I think that, I think we all agree about this more that we can have fun while doing these things, the easier it is to learn, the more we want to share. Um, I, I really, I really want to give that as a piece of advice to, to other folks out there. Try to make this fun, right? They're bring these concepts to life, you know, give them funny names, um, give them pictures or associations. And I think Commodore did that very well too. Very cool swag that I got in the last KubeCon with some Batman stuff, a really cool rubber duck. Um, so shout out to you, shout out to everyone on the Commodore team for, for keeping it real. I just wanted to, to share my screen really quickly. As usual, as you know, because you're also very well versed in our material. That's so cool that you've seen uh, different, different live streams that we've done is that while you are giving your presentation, we have an amazing artist, Angel, um, our guardian angel, who's in the background. And he's always creating an artistic depiction of what the speakers are sharing, all right? So he did uh, He did this. Let me know when you can see my screen. <laughs> all right, so so, so wow. Angel, he's also a musician and he's, he's a very good musician. Uh, so he very much caught on to the artistic theme quite quickly. We also got Kiss and Nirvana in there with the Freddie Mercury remix. I was talking to the two of you before we got started about the rap video, and I feel like I've got a lot of responsibility now. Um, but luckily, Uzi's going to send over some keywords, so you can expect to see that rap video coming out next week. I know that you guys are off on Friday, so there's no point in putting on a video on a Friday. You could do it on a Sunday and wake people up, shake things up on a Sunday. That could be cool. Um, that's what's always fun about working with folks in Israel is like, you don't have to do stuff on a Friday. And if you feel like working on a Sunday, we'll go for it. <laughs> so, fine. so that being said, is there, like I said, we've got the meetup coming up on the 31st. I shared the details for that. Um, so stay tuned because streaming, streaming on Kubernetes, very interesting topic that we've had a couple of talks about before. So very excited to see what's going to be going on there. The stuff you're going to be talking about with our friends from Memphis, um, massive shout out to them as well. Do you, uh, is there anything else we need to know on the Commodore side about things that are coming up soon that we should have on our radar? 
Uh, just keep following us. We keep uh, putting out cool content about Kubernetes. We are also in the business of educating people on uh, Kubernetes, making it more accessible, more uh, prominent in the industry. And uh, we keep updating on our product, our events. We have uh, other um, live events, uh, virtual or otherwise like this, that we are running. Um, and we uh, have our, our own small community that uh, aspires to someday be as big and vibrant as the dark community. And thank you, Bart, for creating this uh, place and this uh, venue for us. To, and it's really inspiring uh, to, to see this community grow and uh, how it engages with each other. So thanks a lot for that. And uh, join, join us on... Uh, Good. Okay. Yeah, you're very easy to find. Um, that's that's a good part about all this. You know, it's a it's, it's a it's a you know a, would say a group where the good people generally st uh, stand stand out. You have connected to some wonderful people in the ecosystem. As Guy mentioned, some of the references out there, Commodore is very well known and will continue to be so. So that being said, thank you so much for your time today. The wonderful presentation. As you said, the slides will be shared in Slack. We'll have everything else as well in terms of the, the links, so you can check that stuff out. We have an in-person meetup for folks that are in the Bay Area tomorrow. If you're around and want to check that out, it will be a Mountain View at the Intuit offices. We also have a live stream um, in the afternoon um, that will be 100% online. Folks want to check that out too. And plenty more things in the pipeline. So anyway, you guys have a good one and we will talk to you soon. All right, take care. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everyone.